Glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. Alleluia. Amen. 1 Kings chapter 3, starting at verse 16. Then came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. And so often we have this pattern when we read stories in the Bible, where we have different groups of individuals being symbolized by different characters. And so we have this image here often of two nations, of two groups of people. For instance, you can think of the nations versus the Jews, or you can think of the saints versus the people of the world. Or sometimes you can have two subgroups of a same group. For instance, amongst the saints, you can have Messianic Jews and people from the nations who are saved and also saints. And so then came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. And so obviously in the image of the king, in the image of Solomon, we can think about the Almighty God before whom people are coming, people who are sinners, people who can be associated with whoredom, people who are prostitutes, people who are no better nor different than prostitutes. In the book of Hosea, we do learn that the people of the Lord at one point as was often the case throughout their history, had committed spiritual whoredom. And so the image of the prostitute is one that is very fitting. Whenever you are looking at humanity, human beings that are flawed and that were born in iniquity from their mother's womb. Alleluia. Then came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. How is it that in the standing of a prostitute, you still get to stand before the king in the king's court? In like manner, when you read the book of Esther, Hadassah originally, Esther managed to find herself standing in the king's court because the golden scepter had been raised for her, because she had found grace in the eyes of the king. And Esther was part of the Jews. And therefore, she was a foreigner having gained access to the court of the king in different circumstances granted where she was going to plead the cause of her people but nonetheless, we see how people of the world, people who are sinners, people who are imperfect, in whom there is nothing good, and whose testimonies should not be relied upon, such people as we also were when we were in darkness, before the Lord knew us, before the Lord took us out of that darkness to bring us into his marvelous light, such people get to tread the court of the Lord. And when we do that, the Lord will tell us, as he told Moses, take the shoes off your feet, take your sandals off your feet, for this ground is holy on which thou standest. Then came there two women that were harlots unto the king, and stood before him. How many times have we read this story, thinking that they were harlots, these women, and we might have self-righteously thought, I am not like these women, Lord. In the same way that the Pharisees said, I am not like this publican thumping with his fists on his chest and recognizing that he is a sinner. But yet the Lord will say that the latter is more justified than the Pharisee who is self-righteous. And this is why in Philippians, Paul says, 
I am not righteous by my own righteousness, which was by the law, but I am righteous by my faith in Christ Jesus, not my own righteousness, but the righteousness which is of faith. Verse 16, then came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. Women who were harlots, who did not have a white robe, a white garment, women who were not fit to be the bride of the king, the bride of Christ. And that was me, and that was you. We are no better. Verse 17, and the one woman said, O oh, my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house. Yes, we were all in the world to begin with. And I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered, that this woman was delivered also, and we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. And so both women were in one house. Both women were in the world and had their iniquity common, one with the other. There was not one of them above the other or better than the other. They were both under condemnation. And so the first one was delivered and then the other was delivered of a child as well. This is the image of these two women having engaged in the scope of their activities as harlots, they engaged in illegitimate, illicit sexual activity. And having done so, having fulfilled the lusts of their flesh, for whatever motive they were practicing this prostitution, the desires of their flesh were accomplished through this unlawful act, both the one and the other, and the fruit of their unrighteousness was made manifest in the birthing of these two children. And this is an image to show that when we do indulge in the lusts of our flesh, there is a satisfaction that we do obtain from it after the fact. There is a reward to the flesh for its iniquity when it is put into practice. However, the thing displeased the Lord because it was by way of prostitution. And the Lord says that where there is gain coming from the labor of an harlot, it shall return to the harlot. In other words, the Lord does not want us to offer to him things that were obtained by way of harlotry, by way of the fulfilling of the lusts of our flesh. And further notice that there were the two of them alone in the house, meaning that there were no witnesses. We will get back to this aspect later. But for now, let us just say that our iniquity does not remain a secret to the eyes of the Lord who sees all things, for all things are naked before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The psalmist will say, Lord, if I be at the bottom of the sea, you can see me. If I be beneath the earth, underneath the earth, in the nether regions, you can see me. And so let us read again from the top, starting at verse 16. Then came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. And the one woman said, O oh my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house, and I was delivered of a child with her in the house. 
And it came to pass that the third day after that I was delivered, that this woman was delivered also, and we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. Verse 19. And this woman's child died in the night, because she overlaid it. Verse 20. And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me, while thine handmaid slept, and laid it in her bosom, and laid her dead child in my bosom. And so in verse 19, we see that the child died in the night because she overlaid it. You see, the judgment of God, once it is settled, there is no need to try to figure out the meaning of circumstances where such circumstances simply set up the judgment of God, the sentence imposed by God unto a party found guilty. You see, when David and Bathsheba had their unlawful affair, their child died. Do not ask yourself what ailment was afflicting the child. There was a decree of death upon that child from the moment he was conceived. And therefore, the judgment of God, the just judge, cannot be escaped. Likewise, in the book of Second Kings, when the son of the Shunammite suddenly died, where he said, my head, my head, and then he died. It was already determined that he would die because God was wanting to glorify himself by this boy being brought back to life by the prophet. And so the child of the first prostitute died. He was the fruit of her womb and he was born into a set of circumstances where he had to die because the end of sin is death. The wages of sin is death, unless God intervenes. The wages of sin is death when we are enticed by impure thoughts, by the possibility of engaging in unlawful acts, when we entertain these thoughts, when we ponder upon these thoughts, they will conceive. They will conceive and bring about the thought of sin, the very thought of committing the sin. And when we go forward, press on and commit that sin, it bringeth forth death. The child was the result of sin. The fruit of her womb was the end point of her sin. Her sinful life of prostitution, of spiritual whoredom as an image. And so there were circumstances set up for the child to die. In like manner, when Ahab, alongside Jezebel, had wronged Naboth to obtain his field for a garden of herbs, mind you, they were willing to take the inheritance of a man. There was a decree in the spirit that both of them would die, Ahab and Jezebel. There was no going around it, although in the case of Ahab, that judgment was delayed in terms of its execution, but the matter was settled. When it was time for Moses to die on Mount Nebo, the matter was settled. Though Moses sought to discuss the matter, the Lord told him, speak not to me about this issue anymore. And so when there is a decree by the Lord, the matter is settled. There were circumstances that came up, and it was the day for the child to die. In 2 Kings chapter 1, Ahaziah 
fell from the lattice in his upper room. When a man in his own quarters falls down on a given day in a place where he knows the premises by heart, where he could be blindfolded and move about without incident because he has the layout in his mind. But when the circumstances set up by God come to fruition, he fell down from the lattice in his upper room. He fell down in his own home of which he knew the setup by heart. Why? Because the day had come where the judgment of God was going to be laid upon him. And so we have exposed how circumstances come about for the judgment of God to be made manifest at the time that he has set for its execution. Verse 19, and this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. The fruit of her womb died. The wages of sin is death. Verse 20, and she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while thine handmaid slept and laid it in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. In John 8, 44, we learn that the devil lies from the beginning. He lieth naturally from the beginning. And when you are his child, you do the same. You come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And therefore she sought to make the seed of the other woman her own seed. In other words, the first prostitute's seed was dead. And now she sought replacement by trying to bring into captivity the seed of the second prostitute. And it doesn't stop there. She took her dead seed, which was dead, and put it at the side of the second prostitute in that she was presenting to the second prostitute a false light. She made it appear that her baby was at her side, but that baby was not hers. That baby was dead. And so there was an appearance of a child being at the side of that second prostitute. There was an appearance of light, but it was a false light because that child no longer had life in it. Darkness comes with death, the scent of death. It has the odor of death unto death, but life has the fragrance of life unto life. Now this woman was not able to produce life and therefore she had to try to lay hands on life from a different source. The devil cannot create life, and therefore he seeks to usurp the life that was given by God to other beings, and he tries to usurp that life to make it his and bring it in subjection to him. And he has successfully done that, bringing humanity under his subjection when he confounded Eve first in the garden. Because the Bible says that the woman was in the transgression and man's fault was that he hearkened unto his wife. Verse 20, and she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while thine handmaid slept. When you neglect the things of the Lord, when you sleep, or when your life of prayer and your life of consecration to the Lord is not optimal, and you are spiritually asleep, that's when the enemy moves in, because he roams about seeking whom he can devour, always. And therefore, when you leave yourself in a vulnerable state, he moves in to steal, to kill, and to destroy.
And here up to this point, he has stolen the child of the second prostitute. While thine handmaids slept, in your moment of weakness, the devil will come in like a flood. In your moment of weakness, the devil will spring into action. And laid it in her bosom, and laid her dead child in my bosom. The devil doesn't only come to take life away, but he wants you to make your abode with death. Remember in Mark chapter 5, where was the abode of that man possessed by the legion? He abode in the tombs. He abode in the tombs with the dead. But yet the Bible tells us that there is no fellowship between light and darkness. There is no fellowship between the living and the dead. Which is why our Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, said, Why seek ye the living amongst the dead? So Satan comes and takes life but then desires for the spirit of death, the realm of death, to become your abode, to become your place of existence. And so he deposited death at the door of the second prostitute, even setting death in her bosom. Verse 21, And when I rose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. And so the woman deciphered that it was not her son. God gives us the ability, even in our conscience, to know the basic things, the fundamental things. But now there will be a dispute that will arise. Because remember that in Genesis, we learned that Eve was the mother of all living and that women are the children of the mother of all mothers. They are the children of women such as Sarai. And so they give life. It is an important part of a woman's ministry towards the Lord. They are chosen vessels through which life comes a great honor. But the fruit of the womb should not be dead. It should be alive. But there is a problem now because one of the women will not accept that the fruit of her womb is dead while the fruit of the womb of the other prostitute, the other woman, is alive. And so it is here an image of our works. Our works do not save us, but we have an image here of good works and bad works. The fruit of the womb was a work where this work perished. It was not deemed proper before the Lord. In like manner, the offering of Cain was not accepted. The work of the second prostitute, the fruit of her womb, lived. And though it was not pleasant in the eyes of the Lord for cause that it resulted from an unlawful act by way of prostitution and illicit sexual relations, nonetheless it found grace, that child, in the eyes of the Lord. And therefore, it is as though that child had found favor, as if by way of a fiction, it had been a good work. So now there is opposition between the two women, the two prostitutes, because one has a good work and another does not. We learn in 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, that the reason why Cain slew Abel is because 
Cain's works were not righteous, while Abel's works were righteous. And so there is now an indication of hatred being found in the first prostitute's heart. So now let us first discuss how there is an opposition now stemming from the fact that one has a good work and the other does not. One abides in death while another abides in life. And there is no fellowship between light and darkness, life and death. Why seek ye among the dead he who is living? Verse 22, and the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son, and the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. You see, the Bible tells us that Jesus did not rely on the testimony of men because he knew what was in man. The Lord tells us there is not one righteous, no, not one. There is not one who seeketh God. And therefore, we are being taught here about the justice of man. We are being taught here how there is a need for multiple witnesses because man is a liar. Man is born in iniquity from his mother's womb. And therefore, enslaved to the devil, he will lie naturally. And in this instance, the first prostitute will lie. And we are about to find out the importance of the Holy Spirit, the importance of the Spirit of God, when it comes to having spiritual discernment in matters that pertain to natural things. Verse 23, then said the king, the one saith, this is my son that liveth, and thy son is the dead. And the other saith, nay, but thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. Verse 24, and the king said, bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. The Bible teaches us here that when you are facing a natural issue, a natural problem that needs to be solved, the human intellect of man is going to come up short. And therefore, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that the wisdom of man at its best cannot rival the wisdom of God. Because the wisdom of man is one that is devilish. It doesn't come from above, but it is devilish. It comes from beneath. This wisdom is intellectual wisdom of man in his natural state. First Corinthians chapter two, verses 14 to 16, lets us know that the natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit whereby all things can be judged, that is by the spirit. But the natural man does not have access to this spiritual discernment in his natural state. And so what will he do? He will use the human intellect, not understanding that the ways of the Lord are above his ways, as there is distance between the heavens and the sea. He will use his human intellect and what he believes to be crafty wisdom, not remembering that his justice is filthy rags. And so what will man do? He will rely on his limited understanding of all things, including his limited intellect and basic understanding of science. If I take one and I divide it by two, it will be equal to one half. And therefore, man in his pride will solve the issue by saying one divided by two is one half. If there is one baby, one child, and two prostitutes, 
then I will give one half to each of the women. Solomon is saying this by design because through him, God wants to teach us and expose the limits of our understanding and the lack of rationality that we have as men when we are trying to analyze complex things based on our wisdom of man, rather than relying on the wisdom of God, which transcends all things. We must be equipped with the mind of Christ. And this is how the spiritual man can judge all things. So Solomon here in the image of the king, in the image of God, shows us here are the limits of your understanding. Where faced with one child and two mothers claiming to be the one mother of the child, the true mother of the child, mathematical human sense would lead to such a solution as to give a half of the child to each mother. But now God will teach us through Solomon the power of divine wisdom. Because the Bible does say, look not at things from an outward perspective, but rather seek to see the insides. And therefore it means you will know them by their fruit, but not their fruit only objectively in terms of their actions, but their fruit inwardly, referring to the fruit of the spirit. And therefore there must be love, there must be joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And in this instance, we're going to highlight love and long-suffering. You see where the intelligence of man, the natural human intellect, where it would have put forth a mathematical solution to this problem, God is teaching us through Solomon that you can discern all things through the Spirit. And there is a word of wisdom now by the Spirit that Solomon will release that will bring about a resolution to the problem. But the source of the resolution comes from the Spirit and not from man's intellect, but from the divine wisdom. The divine wisdom confounds the wisdom of men. While people present at the scene were wondering in their minds, why is the king doing this? Has he gone mad? The King Solomon himself, who was working with the Spirit of God, advising him, knew all along where he was going. He first exposed the limits of the human intellect and now was going to glorify God by showing the far superiority of divine wisdom. Verse 25, and the king said, divide the living child in two and give half to the one and half to the other. The Bible teaches us that the spirit of God looks to the reins and to the heart and only he knows the heart of men. And the way for the Spirit of God to make the heart of man manifest is through the discerning of the intentions of the heart. Remember how the Lord told the Pharisees how they seemed to worship him with their lips, but with their actions, they actually denied him, holding to the traditions of men and making the word of God void speaking as though they were true worshipers, but denying the power of God and his gospel. And so God is a discerner of the intentions of the heart. And where men were unable to figure out the intentions of the heart of each woman, of each prostitute, the divine wisdom given Solomon was going to allow him to figure this out. At this point, it is very interesting to take the time to note that we further understand why they were prostitutes. It implies that the father was unknown. 
so that there was no way from a human standpoint to say, this is the father. We can see the resemblance. And therefore, if we can determine if this man bearing resemblance to the child is actually indeed the one who went in unto this harlot, then do we know that the child is hers. Now, this is one limit of the human intellect in the way that it analyzes the situation. And there is a lack of evidence by way of a natural analysis of the situation. Further, in a second instance, where the father would have been known, there would still be uncertainty. How, you say? It would not have been impossible for that same man to have impregnated both harlots, whether it would be on the same night or on a different occasion, where they would have, in any case, given birth at dates that were relatively close. So maybe the father, although he would have been known, maybe he would have impregnated both harlots in a relatively short span of time. Unlikely, you say? The Bible teaches us in Genesis chapter 19 that the daughters of Lot made him drink and lied down with him. And he knew not when they lied down nor when they stood back up. The Bible teaches us as well in Genesis concerning Sodom and Gomorrah that both old and young surrounded the house looking to know the man who had gone in. The Bible tells us further that a man and his son go in on the same maid. And the Bible also teaches us in 1 Corinthians 5 that there is such sexual immorality in certain communities that a man can have his father's wife. And therefore, the Bible teaches us over and over again that in terms of sexual immorality, man has no boundaries. To where there was a need to say that if a woman lied down before a beast, it was not appropriate. And so can we now say that these two harlots were not impregnated by the same man, either on the same night, in a group activity or separately, or separately, but not the same day that they would have been impregnated, although they gave birth in a time frame that is of proximity, the one with the other. And so all this to say that whether the father is known or not, there remains from a natural perspective variables that cannot be solved with the human intellect. On the one hand is the father is not known. There is no resemblance that can be established with the child where we could know for sure that this man was the one who fathered the child with the second prostitute. But on the other hand, even if we have that information about the father, we don't know if he also impregnated the first prostitute whose child died. In which case, both children might bear resemblance to the father and it now becomes impossible to say if the living is necessarily the child of the second prostitute because she does not have exclusivity concerning having sexual relations with the known father. And so whether the father is known or unknown, the natural human mind and the natural circumstances do not suffice to render proper judgment. And therefore, the human intellect is in a situation that leans on the absurd, where one has to be divided by two. But yet the human mind is strange because it will find comfort in that by having satisfied a mathematical equation that this justice would therefore necessarily be just, where it would actually be absurd. But the divine wisdom rests 
on the intentions of the heart and now is brought forth by King Solomon in the image of God's wisdom to bring a proper settlement to this matter. Verse 25, And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one, and half to the other. By these words, King Solomon is going to make manifest the counsels of the heart. Verse 26, Then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O oh my Lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other woman said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. We said that the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. After having stolen, she now wanted to kill, to destroy. And so now we get a glimpse into the, the seed that is planted in the heart of both women. You see, the parable says that there is a type of heart that has a soil that is not fertile, so that you put a seed there, but it will not find root. And there are hearts that are different, where you plant a seed there and something will grow. But in any case, you also have here an illustration of the wheat and the tear. You see, you will know them by their fruit. The seed that can grow in the first prostitute's heart, whose child is dead, is a seed that brings about a plant that is about death. She says, kill the child. In the same way that the Jews said, crucify him. But what has he done to deserve death? Crucify him, they yelled all the more. This innocent child has done nothing, yet the first prostitute wants that child to be put to death. The Bible tells us, He who hateth his brother walketh in darkness still, and there is no love in that person. And such a person does not love his fellow man, his brother. On the flip side, we see that the fruit of the second prostitute, whose the living child is, has a desire to see the child live, although it would result in her being stripped of her motherhood. Now, when we remember in 1 Samuel chapter 1, how Hannah begged the Lord with everything that she had for a man-child, even saying that she would prefer dying if she did not get that child, bringing us back to the importance of the ministry of bearing children for women, as Eve was the mother of all living. Hannah begged for the child, and when she was able to bear Samuel, she consecrated Samuel to the Lord. And as much as she desired the child, she was willing to honor the Lord by giving the child up so that he could serve the Lord. And so she was stripped of her motherhood. She sacrificed the fruit of her womb so that she could please the Lord. And so she had to renounce motherhood. It is a very painful thing. She tried to hold on as long as she could until the child was weaned. But then she respected the oath that she had made to consecrate the child to the Lord for the child to serve the Lord all his days. And so I say this to underline how important it is for a woman to have a child and how difficult it is for such a woman to let go of a child. Yet, the second prostitute was willing to strip herself bare of motherhood if it meant that the child would live. The seed in her heart was such that a plant grew that was unto life in such a manner that it would say, O oh death, where is thy sting? 
The Bible says there is no greater love than to die for your brother, for your fellow man. And here, although it is not her life which she is giving up, the second prostitute is doing something that is in the image of that by renouncing a fundamental core value of her being. In that way, she's dying to herself because she is giving away the fruit of her womb, flesh of her flesh, bones of her bones. Remember how Adam said concerning Eve, she will be called woman for she came out of man. She is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. And yet about these two, it was said that they shall be one flesh. And so by analogy, you know how a woman would be bound to her child because they were one flesh. And the child was taken out of her, the fruit of her womb. And yet is she willing to sacrifice it and renounce motherhood to offer this as a sacrifice unto the Lord? Meaning she is renouncing something precious to her so that the justice of the Lord can prevail, which is that an innocent child should not die. In like manner, Pilate said, what has this man done worthy of death? Do you understand how Pilate asked this question? After asking, having also asked, what is truth? Truth is also life. Truth is also the justice of God. That an innocent soul should not die. And so the second prostitute renounced motherhood, was willing to do it so that the child would live. And so now the Lord, having seen sinners in this world, you and I, none better than the next, in the image of these two prostitutes, we now see that there are some who have a willingness, just an ounce of willingness to submit to the law of God. Not that they can do it by their own strength, but there is an inclination for them to want to submit. Though they can't do it, they want to submit. There is an ounce of that. For that reason, they find grace and the Lord himself will draw them in to save them. It is not that they can save themselves, but the, but the part of the free will given them, they apply to desiring to submit because they were given such a heart. And seeing that, perceiving that, the Lord extends his grace. And so seeing that the second prostitute had an ounce of a will to submit to the justice of God concerning the preservation of the innocent, God moves in to honor that. And he makes the counsels of the heart manifest. And once he has done that, he's able to determine which of the two prostitutes is truly the mother of the child. And this will be expressed through the word of wisdom that Solomon will give. Verse 27, then the king answered and said, give her the living child and in no way wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. Verse 28, and all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged and they feared the king for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. And so by the power of the Spirit, there was a possibility to solve a problem that could not be solved in the natural. And not only that, but the actual spiritual solving of the situation becomes obvious in the fact that it does not 
stem from a human intellect source. And further, it is manifest that the source of the wisdom used to solve the situation is divine and that it is not of the realm of the human intellect. And so where the grace of God abounded for this child to live, this child who likewise was born in sin, the grace of God was manifested for his glory because he was going to use that child's life as a witness and a testimony of his, that is God's, greatness and perfect judgment. And so it is not of he who willeth or runneth, but of God who giveth grace. And before either of the child did good or bad, there was one upon whom the hand of the Lord already was. And so we see also that the heart of the second prostitute, whose child it was that lived, there was a willingness in her to submit to the law and perfect justice of God that the innocent should not die. And God honored that. Whereas the first prostitute hardened her heart in her plight, in her sorrow, her heart was hardened. And she therefore only considered now death and manifested the fruit of darkness. And that is to steal, to kill and to destroy. You will know them by their fruit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is not a desire to quench our own personal feelings based on our natural emotions. When you have the Spirit of the Lord and the fruit of the Lord, you do not, like Gehazi, seek to monetize an action of the Lord to get personal gain or to get clothes. When you have the spirit of the Lord, you do not seek your own reputation to be above that of others, to love having preeminence over others and trying to keep them at bay so that you can have all the attention and be under the lights by yourself. When you have the spirit of God, you are not trying to bring about division by way of slander, by way of lying and destroying life and being an adversary to your fellow men. The Bible teaches us in Proverbs chapter six that the Lord hateth those who make a lie. And he says in Revelation chapter 22, that liars will not inherit the kingdom. And so where does this bring us? It brings us to the understanding of the wisdom of God, which is above all things. And that's why we should seek to have it. We should seek wisdom and understanding. It brings us to a better realization that spiritual things must be dealt with with spiritual tools, spiritual means which ultimately means that we must judge all things spiritually. The spiritual man can judge all things and that we should not rely on our own understanding because carnal wisdom does not compare to the wisdom of God. It is a flawed wisdom that brings about a faulty judgment, filthy rags. And now do we get to the conclusion of the whole matter? There are sinners in the world. The first one is not better than the next. But it turns out that some will turn to the light and in them will be found a desire to sustain life, a desire to separate from darkness. They will not make their abode with death. 
they will separate and keep themselves clean and holy for the bridegroom. They will not hate their brother. They will, they will not find grievous the commandments of the Lord. They shall not kill and have hate in their heart and be found murderers because murderers have no part in the kingdom of God. And of such the Lord will have mercy. Although he would have wanted all to come to repentance, although he was offered a ransom for many, for those who will humble themselves and honor him according to his divine justice, upon such will he have mercy. And so the second prostitute, who was no better than Rahab, but in like manner as Rahab, submitted to the justice of the Lord and partook in the perfect plan of the Lord to exact his justice and his judgment. Likewise, as Rahab was spared, the second prostitute likewise was spared because she preferred to submit to the justice of the Lord that no innocent life should be taken. And she did that at the cost of losing and being stripped of her motherhood, which is the image of her life, so that the greatest love would be on display. And in light of that, and because there was a desire to submit to the higher justice of God, the Lord honored this and spared the child and restored that which had been stolen. He restored years that could have been stolen. He restored that which would have been murdered. In like manner, he restored Abel through Seth, who was the image of the resurrection, after Abel perished and was sown in the ground, his blood crying out, and a second seed came out, the resurrected seed in the image of a resurrection, Seth came about to replace Abel. And so the Lord allowed the child to live. And so years were given back. A life was given back. A life of which the mother could have been stripped in terms of her motherhood as was Hannah after Samuel was to stay at the temple with Eli, the high priest. And thus the situation was restored where the enemy would have wanted to destroy it. And so we see that in the world there are prostitutes, there are sinners, and that's us. But the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ loved us and died for us that we could be translated from darkness to light by grace through faith. And therefore, in conclusion, we may say that some of us sinners will make it in the kingdom in the image of this second prostitute. And we therefore understand how prostitutes will make it in the kingdom before many. Prostitutes will make it in the kingdom before many who are self-righteous or who believe that they are better than others who are yet in sin. Forgetting that those who are yet in sin, it is in that condition that Christ found us and loved us and saved us. And therefore, where you feel you may be better than the next person, especially an unbeliever, remember this, amongst the prostitutes, amongst the sinners, the Lord Jesus Christ is looking for a heart that is willing to be humble, that is willing to humble itself, that is willing to recognize its weakness so that the Lord can draw such a heart unto him and that it may be said 
that by the Spirit there is an adoption of a person who humbles themselves, of a person of a humble heart who will repent, confess their sins, turn from evil, and put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of their soul, continuing in the commandments of God so that they may truly be his disciples. Let us not be like the Pharisees who look upon others thinking that they are blind and saying, Wilt thou now teach us? Dost thou instruct us? Who art thou? The Lord Jesus Christ told them, If ye were blind, you would have eyes to see that you are in iniquity. But because you think you see, you do not realize that you are truly blind. And not realizing it, you will not seek a remedy and thinking that you see, thinking that you are self-righteous in your eyes, you will perish, die in your sins. But I tell thee of a truth, verily, verily, there comes a day when the first will be last, and the last will be first. The publicans and the harlots will go into the kingdom of God before you. And when that happens, because you will have taught yourself to be self-righteous, there will be no opportunity for you to respond and contend. You will be like this man in Matthew chapter 22, who was taken away, bound hand and feet, and thrown in outer darkness, where he will be held until the day of judgment, just like the angels who had left their first habitation, chained up in darkness until the day of judgment. The publicans and the harlots will go in before you in the kingdom of God. May you be blessed. In the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen.